So tonight is the first night of Hanukkah. It's the season of miracles. It is the festival of lights. And of course, the historical background is a story of valor and courage taking on an immense army and by the hand of Yahweh being delivered the land of Israel and the people from foreign invaders. It's the story of fidelity to God, the hearts of men and women that would not compromise their faith in the shadow of persecution and even death. It's the story of the holy house of God, invaded by pagans and defiled, but the faithful passionately fighting to regain control and immediately began the process of cleansing the temple. They tore down the defiled altar and they lit the golden menorah in the holy place, a light that was never to go out. In searching, they found only enough oil that was sanctified, that was hidden away to last only one day. But by faith, they lit the lamp anyway. And it would take another eight days to press and prepare enough oil. So the miracle happened that the spirit of Yahweh multiplied the oil and kept it burning for the whole eight days. So Yah honored their passion and their zeal because it was for him. It was for his holy house and he blessed them. And so, you know, many Christians think that this holiday has absolutely nothing to do with them. It has nothing to do with Jesus. But this event is recorded in the book of uh, Maccabees and the Apocrypha, the, the whole story of the war. And um, it's not a whimsical tale, but this is a historical account. And it is the events that were prophesied in Daniel. Um, regarding the leopard in Daniel chapter 7 and the shaggy goat in Daniel 8, both referring to Greece. And this was the uh, fulfillment of those prophecies. This was when Greece rose as a world power. Alexander the Great died with no heir, and so his kingdom was divided up into four regions, just as Daniel had proclaimed. And ultimately, it was the Greco-Syrian king, Antiochus or Antiochus Epiphanes, who believed himself to be the manifestation of Zeus. So it was he who invaded Israel and tried to wipe out any trace of the God of Israel. So we can see the fulfillment of all that uh, Daniel had prophesied at that time. Even the abomination of desolation, uh, when Antiochus defiled the holy altar with swine, and set up an image of Zeus in the temple. So this was important to the Jewish people, not only because of a national victory, but they preserved the temple and the Torah, without which Messiah could not have come and fulfilled the scriptures. Uh, it mattered to Yeshua. It mattered uh, so much that the only place that the Festival of Lights or the Feast of Dedication is mentioned in the whole Bible is in John chapter 10. So John 10, 22 says, then came Hanukkah, or it reads also the Feast of Dedication. It was winter in Jerusalem, and Yeshua was walking in the temple around Solomon's colonnade. Then the Judean leaders surrounded him saying, how long will you hold us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us outright. Yeshua answered them, I told you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my father's name testify concerning me, but you don't believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Again, the Judean leaders picked up stones to stone him. So this is very significant. For when the Maccabees tore down the defiled altar, they did not know what to do with the stones because the stones were holy. They had been uh, the altar of sacrifice. And so uh, they didn't know what to do with them. So they piled them up in a place called Solomon's porch or Solomon's colonnade. And they said, and when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us what to do with them. So when we think about it, where did these leaders find stones to uh, want to stone 
Yeshua. So think of it this way. If you're walking through a shopping mall, are you going to just see stones laying around? The colonnade was a paved walkway. It was not a dirt road. So it wasn't like there was just stones everywhere. The stones that they were ready to stone him with were the stones that were from the defiled altar. And so the Messiah had come to Jerusalem at the Feast of Dedication, and the leaders were pressing him for an answer. Are you the Messiah or not? But in answering them, they just closed their ears to the truth, and they called him a blasphemer. Verse 32. Yeshua answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? The Judean leaders answered, we aren't stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. Though you are a man, you make yourself God. Yeshua answered them, isn't it written in your writings? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him? the one the father set apart and sent into the world. You speak blasphemy because I said, I am Ben Elohim or the son of God. If I don't do the works of my father, don't believe me. But if I do, even if you don't trust me, trust the deeds, then you may come to know and continue to understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. Therefore, they tried to capture him again, but he escaped from their hand. I think he just vanished. I think he had the capacity to move into a different dimension and just leave. <laughs> so, you know, just vanish from their sight. So it's, you know, it's said that since they were in a war, that they were unable to keep the Feast of Sukkot at that time, the Feast of Tabernacles. And so Hanukkah is like a belated uh, Sukkot. Both last eight days at Sukkot, they set up, four huge lampstands in the uh, court of the women. And this illuminated the temple so that all around the countryside in the nighttime, the temple was illuminated. It was an extraordinary sight because at that time, of course, there was no electricity. Everything was dark. Um, and to see this you know, light, you probably could see it for miles, was really something. So one winter night, at the start of Hanukkah, a holy angel named Gabriel, which means God is my strength, came to a young woman named Miriam, a virgin betrothed to a man in Nazareth. Having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, you highly favored one, which means graciously accepted or someone who was receiving much grace. She was receiving grace. She was not full of grace. She was not a dispenser of it. So we just want to say that because the Catholics twist it all around. The, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered what kind of salutation this might be. The angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor or grace with God. Uh, behold, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son and will call his name Yeshua. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, how can this be seeing I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is born from you will be called the Son of God. And so, of course, this was a fulfillment uh, from Isaiah. So we have the uh, angel coming to Mary. And uh, in order to confirm that word to her, to Miriam, her name would have been Miriam, the angel Gabriel told her of her cousin Elizabeth, who was the daughter of Aaron, who was married to a priest named Zechariah. They were childless, and she was past the age of childbearing. But the angel said, Behold, Elizabeth, your relative, also has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing spoken by God is impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the servant of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So if we count the weeks from the first night of Hanukkah to the beginning of Sukkot, we arrive at 40 weeks. 
And that is the gestation of a human child. So as Messianics, we believe that Messiah was conceived at the start of Hanukkah and was born at the first night of Sukkot. There, all throughout the scripture, all throughout the New Testament, he is called the light of the world. And he talks about being the light. In John chapter one, it's just filled with references that he is the light, bringing light to us. And so uh, it would make perfect sense that God used this day of Hanukkah. And people say, well, you know, it's not really in the Bible. It's not really one of the appointed feasts in Leviticus 23. But you know what? God is still working. He, he was working all through history. He's still working. And he was revealing a mystery that was hidden from the beginning. And so when we look at this, the miracle of the oil, it took grace. It took the power of God to keep that oil uh, going, to keep it burning that, that whole week of um, Hanukkah. So we know that uh, when a woman conceives, it takes about eight days for that egg to move uh, into place in her body to where it becomes a viable um, uh, pregnancy. And so uh, that is where the light gets stronger every day. So as we light the candles on the menorah every or the Hanukkah every day, and the light gets brighter and brighter, the viability of that um, that uh, conception was getting stronger and stronger. And so Miriam received grace and uh, we know that since he was conceived at Hanukkah, that he was born on the first night of Sukkot. And that's why we always celebrate the birth of Yeshua at Sukkot. We don't do Christmas because mm -hmm. Christmas is just something that they just threw together and put it on the calendar. But um, it's just that that whole cycle, that 40, 40 weeks is just perfect. And so because she received grace, her body was cleansed her temple, she, her body became a temple for the Lord himself. He had come to dwell there as a human seed and the light of the world had come into the darkness of that age. A great heaviness rested on the people because they were oppressed by the Romans. And Hanukkah is a time that we remember that the temple was defiled and then restored. In Genesis chapter three, we read about the woman who was defiled and yet there is the promise that her seed would be uh, the redeemer. So the one that was going to crush Satan's head would come from this defiled woman who was now restored. So Mary represents that restored woman. And we begin to understand that the human body is the ultimate temple that our God Yahweh seeks to restore and to dwell in. So in the Gospels, Yeshua warns us about the abomination of desolation that Daniel had spoken of. And remember, an abomination is something that is disgusting to God. Uh, it makes him feel vomitous. You know, it reminds me of um, Revelation chapter 3, where Yeshua is speaking to the church of Laodicea, and he says, uh, you know, because you are lukewarm, you know, you're disgusting. I, I'm ready to vomit you out of my mouth. That's the, that's the idea of abomination. And so uh, something that's disgusting to God. And then Yeshua had prophesied that their house, the house of uh, the temple, would be left to them desolate because they missed the time of their visitation. So that meant that it would be left empty or vacated. So this is the abomination that causes desolation. This is the thing that puts such a bad taste in God's mouth. He has to leave. And that was uh, what happened at the time of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. We know that the Holy Spirit or the glory of God departed from the temple and rested on the Mount of Olives for three and a half years. But the temple was desolate. And uh, the people were still looking to the sacrifices of bulls and goats and sheep. Uh, they were not looking for the complete and perfect sacrifice of the son of God, they rejected it. And so those sacrifices had become disgusting mm -hmm. to God. But Yeshua also adds in that narrative, let the reader understand. He talks about, um, remember the, uh, the abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke of, but let the reader understand. 
So the defiled temple and uh, that Daniel spoke of was fulfilled in the days of the Maccabees yeah. when the uh, foreign God was set up inside and, and the, the altar was uh, defiled. So something came in to defile it. The acceptable blood on the altar was exchanged for something filthy, for swine's blood. And the people didn't want it. You know, there were some that were called Hellenists and uh, they went along with all the changes, right? With all the, the new mm -hmm. ways of doing everything. And uh, they were okay with it, but many people fought against it. They stood up and said, no, does this seem familiar at all to you today? There are people who are standing up and saying no, and other people are capitulating and saying, sure, whatever you want us to do, we'll line up. So, you know, they said, we're not going to betray our God. You can't have our temple. You can't drive us away from worshiping our God. And so they fought. Perhaps Messiah was speaking to our generation. He said, let the reader understand. Perhaps he's warning us that we need to have the mindset of the Maccabees. Yeah. One who stands up and says no. So we will not be like the Hellenist Jews who did whatever the occupiers told them to do. They were commanded that they could not go to the synagogue. They could not keep Shabbat. They were not able to read the Torah or teach their children about God. They were not to circumcise their boys or to keep kosher. They were to be like the world. They were to dress like them. They were to uh, be like them in thought and practice. So those who were faithful to God and were not willing to compromise, uh, they had to make a decision. They had to decide right from the start where they were going to stand. And even if the whole world went a certain way, they were going to follow God, even if it meant their death. So they did not simply hide until they came for them and killed them, which is what some of the faithful did, but they went to caves, they went to the mountains, but the Greeks found them anyway, and they slew them. They didn't fight back because they came to them on the Shabbat. And so the Maccabees decided that if they just did that, then Israel would disappear. They would be completely uh, absorbed into Greek um, uh, society and, and everything about them would disappear. And so they fought against it and they refused to bow to foreign gods and to those that worship them. So today we have to have the heart of the Maccabees. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and we must guard it and keep it from being defiled. We're not supposed to do anything deliberately to harm ourselves. So we're not supposed to use illicit drugs or excessive alcohol, anything that would bring harm to us. If sickness happens, we're not accountable for that. It's what happens to us. We didn't do it, okay? We aren't responsible for hurting our bodies. But if we deliberately bring harm to ourselves, it is sin. And so if the world commands us to hand over your temple, so that they can defile it with technologies that we do not understand and uh, that there is evidence that it's unsafe, then, um, you know, it might even possibly change the makeup of who we are, if not now in the future, mm -hmm. it will make us different than the way God made us. If we bow to their demands and we do not fight back and say no, mm -hmm. then we are sinning against the temple, against the dwelling place of our God. In May of 2020, uh, the first congressional effort to codify what might be the first of many um, unconstitutional legislative attempts to create a totalitarian one world government under the guise of a, attacking the, you know, the, uh, we'll just call it the plague, uh, is HR 6666. Some weeks earlier, the UN Health, uh, World Health Organization recommended house-to-house -house searches for family members infected with the plague and the removal of those infected to a mandatory quarantine. The American reaction was that this couldn't happen here, but that did not stop House Democrats from introducing HR 6666, also known in the acronym of TRACE, 
uh, meaning testing, reaching, and contacting everyone act, um, which is basically a door-to-door -door testing, forced isolation and quarantine with mandatory vaccination to come. So this was introduced by uh, Representative Bobby Rush from uh, Illinois on May 1st of 2020. And the TRACE Act would establish a nationwide contact and quarantine program it had been referred to the House Energy and Commerce Committee for a yet to be uh, for a hearing before the Health Subcommittee. Um, it is a violation of the Fourth Amendment and uh, would have granted $100 billion to the CDC to establish a local mobile health unit in each community to conduct a diagnostic door to door testing program. So Fortunately, that bill died, but it was um, reintroduced again under uh, HR 725 or 725 or 726. I'm not sure which might be 726. And that is still pending in Congress. So that could still happen. And it seems unbelievable that such measures could you know, be under consideration. But I'm sure that Australia and Austria and other nations also felt the same way. And it's happening right before our eyes. And if the 6666 number isn't a little bit striking, uh, you know, there's a deliberate message being sent. And since you know, the new uh, Bill Gates patent also makes use of the similar numbers. It was patent 2020-60606, okay? This is no accident that they're using these numbers. Um, Microsoft was granted a patent for cryptocurrency system using human body activity data. So when a person performs certain tasks that can be recorded by body activity, heart rate, brain waves, or other bodily functions, this data is transmitted and they will reward that person with cryptocurrency. Now they're making it all, you know, on the surface, very, you know, innocent. You know, this is a way that people can do things and make money, which none of this makes sense to me, but apparently they say you can. Uh, for the now, they're saying that this is just transmitted or detected by, you know, whatever, your, your phone or whatever, but they're not saying, what is probably going to come is that it will be also detected by an implantable device. And we can see that that will be you know, implemented later. So there's lots of information out there and it's difficult to verify. Some of it is just people speculating wildly and making it sound like it's you know, truth. But uh, there are some things that we do know that are true. We do know who the people are that are doing this and what they plan to do. We know who they're connected to and what they're all about. We know that they're all interconnected and they have spoken publicly from their own lips. We've heard these things right from them. So it's not like, you know, third party, you know, this person said this kind of thing. We've heard them say these things over the, over the last several years. And so we know that the Gates Foundation has been busy developing the quantum dot technology, uses an en enzyme called luciferous, uh, it glows, and they're planning to use this to imp uh, implant medical records as well as use it for um, the uh, potion delivery system. And Bill Gates actually funded research in 2019 that developed an invisible and plantable technological device that tracks vaccinated people and can be scanned by a cell phone. The study was published in the Journal of Science, uh, Translational Medicine, and then in another publication called Science Alert in an article of December, 2019, uh, there was um, an article called an invisible quantum dot tattoo could be used to ID vaccinated kids. The invisible tattoo accompanying the vaccine is a uh, pattern made up of minuscule quantum dots, tiny semiconducting crystals that reflect light. 
that this glows under an infrared light. The pattern and vaccine get delivered to the skin using high-tech dissolvable microneedles made of a mixture of polymers and sugar. The uh, publication by scientists from MIT is captioned bio compatible near infrared quantum dots delivered to the skin by microneedle patches record vaccination. So what it uses also is a dye that is not visible to the eye, but that dye stays there. That is a mark that is a tattoo that you can't see except under infrared light. So it's pretty far-fetched, like a conspiracy theory, but then why is Europe in an uproar? Because they are fighting against these uh, plague passports. The idea of, you know, your papers, please. I mean, that was all over Europe. That's still in the collective memory of Europeans. And, you know, concerning, they're concerned with counterfeit records that will lead to a personal biometric passport implanted at the time of your um, potion, okay, being implemented. So we know that uh, there are great risks with this and many people have been injured. Many people have died taking this and uh, the powers that be are suggesting that uh, the jab is not effective and that with each passing season, they're coming up with worse and worse versions of the plague. And so they will have to reinvent the potion. And when they do, they're going to implement it with this new delivery system. It'll be more effective than a traditional needle and conveniently will implant a device to keep your records for you. So they're getting us used to the idea of no jab, no job, no jab, no entry to society, no jab, no buying and selling. So we are closer than close to the day. So are we ready to stand before the Lord as faithful ones who see where all of this is going? Are we like the Maccabees at heart saying no to the things that they want to force on our bodies? If we have not got uh, the sovereign rights over our own bodies, then they own us. They've enslaved us already. So one day soon, they're going to um, inject luciferous into the human body with a potion that will change your DNA. And this will be the abomination of desolation. Everybody talks about a brick and mortar temple standing in uh, Jerusalem, but I don't believe that's it. I believe in our day, this is what Jesus meant when he said, let the reader understand. It's going to change people from being human in the image of God, putting us in, uh, changing us into the DNA of the enemy what he has designed, filling us with a counterfeit light because it glows, that luciferous glows. And that light is not the light of God. That light is from the enemy. It is from Satan, from Lucifer. And so Yeshua said, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So just as uh, the body of Miriam was that temple, was that place that Messiah dwelt in her while he was coming into the world. So too, our bodies are also a temple. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. And when the uh, temple stood, it was the job of the high priest, it was the priest to keep that uh, lampstand lit, to keep that everlasting light going. And just as God had done it by the Holy Spirit, had kept the oil burning so too, he keeps it burning for us. That light of life that's in us is not our work. It is the work of that high priest and Yeshua. He is that high priest. And so we are called the children of light. And the scripture says, you are a light of the world and a city on a hill cannot be hidden. So just as the temple lit up the sky uh, during the, the nights of uh, Sukkot, we also were supposed to shine in darkness. And while this world is growing darker and darker, each passing day, especially in this season, when we are in the darkest time of the year, we have to be a city on the hill. Even though 
you know, we're talking about physical darkness. We are in a terrible spiritual darkness in the world. And we have to shine the light of Christ Jesus with fearless conviction. And we have to stand and resist every ungodly mandate that would violate the sanctity of our bodies or cause us to capitulate to ungodly demands, even if it costs us. That's why so many churches have faced fines and imprisonment because they kept the doors open because they obeyed God. We have to be faithful and obey God and not man. Proverbs 4.18 says, The path of the righteous is like the dawning light that shines more and more until the perfect day. We don't need to be rewarded by Bill Gates' cryptocurrency. Our reward is going to come from the Lord. We will be like we were before the fall because they shined from the glory. And the, Lord, the Lord's glory is going to be on us because we are his temple. And he's going to fill us to the fullness with his presence. Just like the wise virgins like Mary who believed God, who have found great favor, great grace, are filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit, we are going to shine. And it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Daniel 12, 3 says, Those who are wise will shine as the brightness of the expanse. Those who turn many to righteousness will shine as the stars forever and ever. So Messiah has shed his blood for us and cleansed our defiled altars. He is the one that is greater than Judah Maccabee. He has made us cleansed forever. And we need to guard this temple that has been bought by such a high cost as we wait with expectation and real hope for the coming of our King Yeshua, our Lord, God, and Messiah. So may you shine brightly as you have never shined before. Amen.